Thank you for joining us at our first session of the new to DM track at our 2020 MDF conference. My name is Lorraine Dressler and I have DM1. I was diagnosed eight years ago along with my younger daughter when she was pregnant with our first grandchild. The baby was born with congenital myotonic dystrophy and my daughter was diagnosed with childhood onset. So it is with great interest and pleasure that I introduce Dr. Erica Green, who will provide for us an overview of myotonic dystrophy, the genetics of the different types of DM, as well as anticipation, uh, the many body systems that are affected by DM, what is common and, and not, uh, anesthesia precautions, cognitive and neuropsychiatric effects, expectations, preparedness, and more. Dr. Green is co-director of the MDA Neuromuscular Clinics and director of ALS Clinical Research Division and head of the Neuromuscular Medicine Division in the Stanley A. Chappelle Department of Neurology at Houston Methodist. Her clinical focus includes a wide range of neuromuscular disorders, muscular dystrophy, myasthenia gravis, ALS, inflammatory myopathy, uh, mitochondrial and metabolic myopathy. She directs clinical trial research in neuromuscular medicine and serves as primary investigator for several trials, ALS, myasthenia gravis, CIDP, and metabolic myopathies. Dr. Green reached, received her bachelor's degree at Rice University and completed her medical school at education at University of Texas Medical School at Houston. She completed adult neurology residency training and ALS basic science research fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Green then went on to complete the Physician Scientist Development Fellowship Program at Baylor College of Medicine and was appointed as co-director of the MDA clinic at Houston Methodist Neurological Institute, where she serves as education director for the residency and fellowship programs. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Green. So take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Erica Green and I am a neuromuscular specialist and director of the Myotonic Dystrophy Multidisciplinary Clinic in Houston, Texas at the Houston Methodist Hospital. It is my pleasure today to provide you this lecture on the basics of myotonic dystrophy, not only for you as the patient, but for your community of caregivers, family members, and supporters. As a person who specializes in treating patients with different nerve and muscle diseases, almost 10 years ago, I realized that my myotonic dystrophy patients were a unique group of patients. Not only were they kind, loving people, but their disease affected them in multiple ways more so than my typical muscle patients or other patients with muscular dystrophy. And we discovered very early on that the best way to help our patients is to provide care that addresses all of their needs. But I also believe that patients who understand their disease, have knowledge about how to manage it and seek care, do better. So this lecture is for you for the patients, for your community, for your loved ones. Uh, and I thank you for uh, attending. I'm gonna get started by sharing my screen. So this is a case that I first came across over 10 years ago and it was the reason why we decided to create a clinic just for patients with myotonic dystrophy. 
This was a 42 year old gentleman who was brought to a regular neurology clinic by his father. He was in a wheelchair and he was so sleepy, uh, it was difficult to wake him up for the evaluation. He had what we call severe dysarthria, which is difficulty uh, with speech, very slurred speech. His lids were nearly closed and he was very, very weak. He had not been to see a doctor in quite a long time, including a heart doctor or a lung doctor, nor had he had any of the labs uh, completed, which were recommended almost six to eight months prior. And his exam was difficult to do, but what was very impressive about him is that his fingers and lips were pale blue as if his circulation was poor. Uh, he had swelling in his legs and his heart rate was extremely low down to the 40s. Um, and I was very concerned that he was in heart failure uh, or some type of heart lung problem and that he needed to go to the hospital. He refused and he and his father, we could not con convince him otherwise. And it is my regret to say that a few days later, I found out that this young gentleman passed away in his sleep. And from that point on, I realized that our patients need more well-rounded care. I realized that many patients find it difficult to see multiple doctors in multiple locations unless they have the help of a family member. It's just a huge landscape to navigate, even for those without a muscle disease. So it was because of this case that we began to provide care where we brought the specialties in one clinic for the patient. Um, and so that began my journey in terms of caring for myotonic dystrophy patients. And the whole point of multidisciplinary care, of education, uh, is to improve the access to care so that patients can have a place to go where specialists who are familiar with their disease can care for them, screen them, manage them, for the primary goals of improving survival and equally important to improve the quality of life. In addition to provide an opportunity to take part in clinical research and trials, as well as what we're doing today, which is education of our patients and our colleagues. So what is myotonic dystrophy disease? It's more than just a muscular dystrophy. It's considered a multi-systemic disease. That is because patients with myotonic dystrophy have more than just muscle weakness. As you can see in the top left corner is a picture of a gentleman with myotonic dystrophy. The typical features are facial weakness, a narrowing of the face, um, lid drooping, what we call ptosis, weakness of the lips and mouth with an opening of the mouth, and although patients have weakness throughout their body, most will tell you that with the most common type, they have weakness of their hands and of their feet. Difficulty picking things up, difficulty grabbing and holding things. And I think that one of the most classical features is what we call myotonia, which I'll talk about in a minute. But like I said, this is a multi-systemic disease. And not only does it affect muscle, uh, but it also can uh, be associated with cataracts, even at very early ages, even in childhood. We know that it affects heart muscle, and more specifically, the rhythm of the heart, the system in the heart that manages heart rate, uh, and the electrical activity is disrupted, um, as well as the muscles of breathing. And we're going to talk about some of the other organs and systems that are affected. Here is a small picture of a muscle biopsy, and it's hard to see, but this reminds me to share with you that even on a muscle biopsy, we see the dystrophy, the abnormal muscle shape and configuration. Um, the fibers are of variable sizes. And so even on a muscle biopsy, we can see the changes that correlate with the muscle weakness we see in our patients. Here in the middle is a list of other organ systems that are affected. We know that the gastrointestinal tract is slower. It also moves abnormally. So patients will often have a variety of symptoms 
not only of the GI tract, but of the liver, of the gallbladder, we know that the endocrine system, which is the hormone regulating system, is also uh, can be affected where patients are predisposed to um, glucose intolerance or diabetes, or patients may have difficulty with fertility or even pituitary or thyroid dysfunction. We know that the immune system can also be decreased and impacted as well as bone, skin, and other neurologic systems, including hearing loss. We've talked about cataracts and nerve involvement. So when we speak about the muscle involvement, which is what most patients think about and most people think about when we think about a myotonic dystrophy or any dystrophy for that matter, is the skeletal muscle weakness. So this is a larger picture of our gentleman. And again, you see uh, the atrophy around the face and the mouth, the lid drooping, the narrowing of the face. And because of hormonal issues uh, with low testosterone, um, most patients with this particular type one have thinning or loss of hair very early in life, as well as weakness, especially in the hands with decreased grip and fine motor dexterity. Uh, and this is a bigger picture of the muscle biopsy. Typically, uh, these black little dots should be on the, around the muscle, but they're centralized, which suggests abnormalities. We see that the muscles are of various sizes, some are large and some are big. Um, and so, and this is not normal either. Uh, these are ring fibers, also suggesting a dystrophic or uh, damaging process. So the muscle uh, biopsy, when we look on a, a microscope, also correlates or at least reflects the disease in terms of weakness. Now, I mentioned myotonia, which is one of the classic features of myotonic dystrophy. And not only is there dystrophy with weakness, but the muscle is hyper excitable. Instead of relaxing as it should, it sort of persists in its contraction. And often this may be the earliest sign in the disease. So I'm going to show you some videos here. And, that and I'm going to come right here. And this is percussion myotonia, where when you tap on the muscle, the muscle hyper excites and contracts abnormally. Under normal circumstances, it should not do that. And so patients will, also, will often say, I, when I grab the door handle, when I shake a hand, it's hard to release. And that can involve most muscles, eye muscles, swallowing muscles, muscles of the legs, as well. Even the tongue, which I'll show you here, this is also percussion myotonia. By irritating the muscle, it is hyper excitable and contracts. And so this is a prototypical feature of myotonic dystrophy and often one of the earliest signs of the disease. <laughs> As we talked about, the heart muscle is also involved, specifically the conduction pathways. There are pathways in the heart, um, electrical pathways, which uh, send an electrical signal from the top chambers of the heart through the middle of the heart, and these nerve fibers or signals it's activate the bottom of the heart as well. So you get an electrochemical uh, stimulation of the muscle and often in myotonic dystrophy it's these pathways that are abnormal or degenerating so patients can present with decreased heart rate where their heart rate is below normal or low normal low 60s um, or they can um, each beat from the top to the bottom does not translate so you might have 65 beats here, but only 58 are being perceived here. And that can be what we describe as heart block. And heart block can progress from just first degree all the way to third degree where none of the signals from the top chamber are even registering in the bottom chamber. And this is a dangerous situation when patients have third degree heart block. 
And so often, um, this is one of the major reasons why patients need to see doctors and be evaluated, because a lot of these symptoms can occur unbeknownst to the patient, uh, including just sudden death, dying in one's sleep, passing out, abnormal rhythms, either low rate rhythms or high rate rhythms, what we call tachyarrhythmias or bradyarrhythmias, or just plain heart failure. And the first case I mentioned to you probably had uh, features of these and possibly died due to that. So in addition, we talked about breathing. The muscles of breathing, the rib cage muscles and the diaphragm, even the swallowing muscles can predispose to breathing or respiratory dysfunction. Patients um, can have varying degrees of not being able to catch their breath when they exert or do housework or try to exercise. But more importantly, we know that not only are the muscles of breathing weak, but the part of the brain which regulates breathing may also be affected in this disease. So the breathing or the respiratory centers in the brain which drive breathing may be abnormal and predispose to periods of not breathing, especially during sleep. This is a, a kind of what we call sleep apnea uh, when, when it's coming from a brain problem in myotonic dystrophy, it's called central sleep apnea. But often patients will have what we call obstructive sleep apnea because the muscles of the throat are swallowing or the muscles of the diaphragm or the rib cage are also weak. So the air is not passing through from the outside to the inside. And this can predispose to some of the sleepiness, some of the memory issues, as well as lead to further heart damage and failure. Again, these are very important. And this underscores the reason why patients need to be evaluated regularly. The other, uh, uh, other signs and other systems that we mentioned earlier is the gastrointestinal tract. And this can be a, a broad spectrum of different disorders. Again, there can be a combination of constipation or diarrhea. And often patients have been told they have irritable bowel syndrome, which is often characterized by alternating diarrhea or constipation. Abdominal pain and cramping even painful vomiting, uh, having to regurgitate or bring up food because of pain and nausea. Uh, often there's a higher incidence of gallstones and what we call biliary sludge, bile backup in the gallbladder system. And often patients will see a liver doctor, a hepatologist, either before they're diagnosed or after they're diagnosed because uh, they have elevated liver enzymes, and so they'll, be, they'll have an ultrasound, CAT scan, and sometimes we'll have to undergo a liver biopsy because other doctors are concerned that there's a liver problem. And often nothing else is found, at best maybe a fatty liver, but this is also uh, seen commonly in myotonic dystrophy patients and is not at greater risk uh, for cirrhosis per se. We talked about the brain earlier and that many of our patients uh, have parts of the brain that are affected, specifically parts related to your breathing, uh, your control centers for breathing, but also your sleep uh, day wake cycle, your sleep wake cycle, what makes you sleepy at night and what makes you more awake and alert during the day. And often in our patients, uh, being sleepy, uh, what we call hypersomnolence, which is excessive sleepiness, is very common. And patients often say they had difficulty waking up for school, even as children or teenagers. Or if they didn't have anything to do, they could stay up very late and go to sleep and stay asleep until late morning or early afternoon. And often that sleep-wake cycle is off. We know that there are cells and systems um, the hypocretin system or the orexin system that are, is abnormal. And these systems tend to be uh, associated with decreased um, normal sleep-wake cycle. We also see on the brain imaging, this is an MRI of the brain, and this is a, at the lower part of the brain. Uh, this is the cerebellum, this is the temporal lobes. Your ear, left ear would be here, right ear would be here, 
Uh, these are uh, where your eyeballs and optic nerves are. So this is the front and this is the back. And as we come up to the top, we see this white sort of patchiness inside the brain system. These are not strokes, but often patients will have these nonspecific signal abnormalities in the brain tissue. Uh, so we know there's something going on in the brain, not only with sleep, but also with hormonal control, the pituitary gland. And often there can be varying degrees of uh, intellectual issues or learning disabilities. And often even for mildly affected patients, there can be memory issues, poor attention, distractibility, uh, word finding issues that patients complain of. We talked about the classic cataracts, the Christmas cataracts. Uh, which can be seen with specialized slit lamp examination by an ophthalmologist here. Uh, but also patients may have other issues, including retinal disease and low ocular pressure, uh, which is the opposite of high ocular pressure that we often see with glaucoma. And then we talked about the hormonal issues, and this can range from the brain where the pituitary and another a hormonal region called the hypothalamus sort of regulates all of our hormonal systems from our thyroid to the parathyroid, which regulates calcium, to our adrenal glands and uh, kidney, and even our um, uh, ovaries and our testes in terms of fertilization. And so, um, as you can see, as we're going through this, that this truly is not just a muscle disease and requires more than just care of muscle weakness and rehab, but multiple specialties. Then there actually is some evidence that our patients may have a higher risk of cancer. Um, when looking at what we call epidemiologic studies, there is a, a, a slight increase possibly of, of cancers in our patients. And this can range from uh, female organ cancers, colon, brain, prostate, skin, and thyroid, and even a type of skin um, sort of cancer called a pilometricoma. Uh, often patients will have this nodulocystic um, um, a tumor of the skin, usually in the scalp that has to be removed. And even patients have been diagnosed with lymphoma and leukemia. Um, and so before we go on, I just want to stress that this truly is a multisystemic disease for many reasons. And we've gone over specifically the major systems involved. And it's important for you as the patient and for your family and your community to be aware of this so that you can engage your primary care physician, your neurologist about maintaining and watching over these things, seeking specialty care. And we'll go over that in just a little bit. So what causes myotonic dystrophy? Well, there are actually two types. The most common is type one, um, and the second is type two. Um, and these are inherited disorders. This means that there is a mutation in one's DNA, uh, your genes, which encode everything about you, your hair color, your height, what you've inherited from mom and what you've inherited from dad. And diseases that are due to DNA or gene mutations often are passed down from one or both parents. In the case of myotonic dystrophy, the mutation associated with type 1 and type 2 are passed down typically by one parent, either a mother or a father. So each child has a 50-50 chance of getting that gene with the mutation. And the mutations associated with myotonic dystrophy are unique. Often we think about, let's say, a spy code, and that's a good way to think about genetics, a spy code that you have to decode to get the secret message. Our DNA is similar to a spy code that has to be decoded into a message that leads to an answer. In terms of myotonic dystrophy, the mutation in the DNA or spy code isn't missing but the message keeps repeating itself and repeating itself hundreds, almost th even thousands of times. And so much so that it sort of disrupts the whole system. It's like um, a, a sewer system that's backed up or um, a hose or a pipe that's backed up. Everything messes up um, from that point of obstruction or disruption 
um, backwards. And that's the same thing going on here. So for type one, um, on chromosome 19, this is one of the, the gene locations, there is a gene called DMPK gene, which has a repeat code, CTG, which keeps repeating itself, as you see here. And as you can see, normally, it should be of a normal length. And usually for type 1, it's under 35. But for myotonic dystrophy patients with the type 1 mutation, this expansion can go to over 100. And for worse cases or earlier cases, into the 1,000 repeats. For type 2, it's a different gene. It's the zinc finger 9 gene, which is on a different gene location, chromosome 3. But what's important is that the code is a little bit longer. It's CCTG. But what's similar is that it also is a repeated sequence, even more so than type 1, and similarly causes disruption in the whole decoding system of our DNA. One word that you might have heard about when it comes to myotonic dystrophy is anticipation. Anticipation describes a phenomena where the longer the repeat of that gene mutation that I mentioned, the earlier the onset of the disease. And this picture here represents that generational anticipation. You have grandmother, adult daughter and son. And grandmother really has very mild signs of myotonic dystrophy. Maybe the muscles of her uh, forehead are a little weak, her eyes are a little droopy, but really, you really don't see much of those features. And even the daughter, you don't see the features. But the son was born with what we call congenital, at birth, myotonic dystrophy. And you can see the weakness of the forehead, the opening of the mouth, because the, the muscles around the mouth are weak, even some of the lid drooping here. And so this is a classic picture of anticipation in that the grandmother had 60 repeats, and she had very mild disease and was never diagnosed. She didn't know that the myotonia in her hand was abnormal, and she had had cataracts removed and just felt that it was age-related. Her daughter had a larger number, so the repeat size increased anticipation with each generation. And so she had an earlier onset, but she and her mother were not diagnosed until her son was born. And as you can see, between the grandmother, the adult daughter, and the grandson, the repeat size is even larger in the grandson. And he was born with a much more severe form. And this is the phenomenon of anticipation. This table here shows the age of onset inversely correlates with the size of the repeat. So here is the age, 0 to 80. Here are the repeat sizes, uh, under 1,000 all the way to over 3,000. And as you can see, the lower the repeat size, under 1,000, the older the age of onset, 40, 50, 60. However, once you get above 1,000 into the 2,000, 3,000 range, the vast majority of these are born with it. 0, 0.0, day of birth. And so this is just a diagram to show the same thing. And so this is actually a patient of mine who's given permission for her picture. She has a very strong family history, not only of uh, patients who are mildly affected like she is, but also of pa patients in her family who are more severely affected because of this phenomena of anticipation. So for children who are born the congenital onset, it's a more severe form. And usually we see that congenital or at birth onset when the mutation comes through the mother for reasons that we still are studying, not quite absolutely sure about, but we have some ideas. The number of those repeats sort of really expand more than just in an additive way, but in a multipli multiplicative way. And that is associated with a congenital onset. In fact, many adults are diagnosed when their child is born with it, uh, not knowing that they had it.
And so these babies typically have generalized muscle weakness. They're what we call floppy babies or hypotonia. And they can have complications or issues from breathing issues, maybe having to be supported on the ventilator for a time. There may be feeding difficulties. They may have contractures or club feet. Tinting of the mouth, as you can see here, because of weakness of the muscles around the mouth and the lips, lid drooping and varying degrees of intellectual uh, developmental issues, including mental retardation. And so these are just the percentages of children um, uh, with uh, childhood onset. I'm going to, with, um, with some of these features. Um, so if they're at birth, congenital, um, often prior to being born, the pregnancy may be complicated by too much amniotic fluid. Um, they're born very floppy, floppier than their siblings and have difficulty sucking in between 10 to 20%. And then as they develop, um, they may have difficulty or may have delayed motor milestones where they sit up, go walk, lay, might even need physical therapy, uh, clumsiness. Uh, there may be de delayed mental development or speech abnormalities requiring speech therapy, recurrent ear infections because of the anatomy, the narrowing of the face, and even eye problems. These are children who didn't have the disease or didn't obviously have the disease at birth, but had it later in childhood. Um, they were diagnosed later. And so their symptoms weren't severe enough as when uh, compared to children born with it, but you can still see the tinting of the mouth here in this patient and this patient, the elongated face, but otherwise can look relatively unaffected. But nonetheless, these children often have symptoms that may or may not be seen as myotonic dystrophy until they're diagnosed from fatigue. They may have difficulty on the playground, not able to keep up as the other kids. We talked about excessively sleeping, not being able to wake up on time for school, swallowing difficulties, abdominal pain and issues. In addition to some of the features on the face and the limbs, myotonia, 70% with myotonia. And in terms of cognitive or intellectual development, it can vary um, from 10% with normal IQ, but 40% being diagnosed with mental retardation um, and borderline uh, mental retardation, 50%. So again, the earlier the onset, um, usually the more severe the disease um, and often correlated with the number of repeats. Type two, uh, is another type of myotonic dystrophy, which has similar features, but it's not exactly the same. Again, the genetic defect is a repeat. It's a different gene and a different location in our DNA. But nonetheless, these patients can also have muscle weakness. What's different is it's usually in the adult age. We don't see children or babies with this type. And instead of it involving predominantly the hands or the feet uh, as an early symptom, it typically causes more weakness in the shoulder muscles or the hip and thigh muscles, what we call proximal muscle weakness. And we don't typically see the facial weakness or the facial weakness around the mouth or the eyes like we do with type one. And many of these patients have myotonia in their muscles uh, and, and it, it limits them, but it also uh, seems to be associated with a greater complaint of pain early on. And often they'll be seen by a doctor not knowing they have type two myotonic dystrophy, but they're going to be seen for other disorders, cramping, uh, fibromyalgia, muscle spasms, and then have a test which leads to the diagnosis. So this is a busy slide, but I just wanted to compare the, the two types of myotonic dystrophy. You have type one and type two. They're both inherited as a genetic mutation that is passed down from one parent. So it's a dominant mutation. Anticipation, we talked about the number of repeats. The higher the number of repeats, the earlier the onset. We see that very typically with type one. We don't really see it, and we're not too sure about that correlation. It's not as tight with type two. Again, childhood onset, uh, infant onset, we don't really see with type two. And both have muscle weakness, although type two has it more in the proximal shoulder hip muscles. Um, and typically type two, the, they won't have smaller muscles, what we call atrophy, they'll actually have kind of large calves. Whereas our type ones, the muscles tend to thin out.
However, it's important to know that the extra muscular uh, symptoms, the other organs that we talked about are still affected in type two, although they may be not as severe, but they're still there and need to be evaluated for. So the heart, the breathing, the brain, the hormones, all of that still is involved in type two. And so both patients need to be evaluated by multiple specialists. So this is a patient with type two. Both of these are my patients who have given consent for their pictures. And uh, this patient has type two. And as you can see, the facial features are not the same as someone with an adult onset type one. You see a little bit of the drooping, a little bit of the open mouth. Uh, the eyebrows are raised because the muscles of the forehead are a little weak. And she has type one with over 200 repeats. And she was diagnosed in her 60s due to calf pain. This uh, young woman uh, um, had type two. And as you can see, you don't see the lid drooping. You don't see um, the weakness around the lips. And she otherwise was diagnosed in, in her 50s only because of myotonia in her hands. So what is the prognosis, especially if patients are not in a care facility or are not receiving regular care? These are the things that can happen because they're not being monitored. Um, cardio, heart, respiratory, breathing failure can occur in 70% of cases. And this, is, these, this condition, this complication is probably the leading cause of poor outcome and decreased survival or complication. And although we see patients from infancy to adulthood, obviously the age of death varies. But if you put all people in one category, the average age of death can be 53 if patients are not um, managed and evaluated for these complications. 40% um, can have respiratory failure, 30% can have um, just pure heart failure, um, and typically, the predictors are older age, male gender, and having changes on an EKG. The, the test where they check your heart rhythm, they put the, the electrodes on your chest, the EKG, often that can be the earliest sign that there is a heart problem. And so these are called irregularities of the heart rhythm or arrhythmias. And this is the most common heart manifestation of myotonic dystrophy. First degree block, we talked about that, occurs in about a third of patients. Um, but patients can have a variety of different arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation or flutter or ventricle, lower heart arrhythmias as well. Uh, but it's important to know that even a regular EKG can sort of screen patients and identify the risk for this, uh, these conditions. So this is just a reminder of the genetic defect. Again, it's a gene mutation that keeps, uh, is a code that keeps repeating itself. It's CTG for type one, CCTG for type two. And it sort of disrupts this, the whole decoding system for how our genes are decoded and read. So again, I use the analogy of a spy code. And so here you have a normal, um, message. Um, the DNA is the spy code and then it's decoded into a message and for us that's called messenger RNA but the messenger RNA has a lot of interruptions in it and so some of the words in that messenger RNA don't need to be there. The message is hidden in the RNA and so we have proteins and enzymes and all kinds of molecules which clean up that message, remove some of the extra pieces that don't make sense so that we have a clear message here. And for type one uh, myotonic dystrophy, this gene is DNPK. For type two is zinc, uh, zinc finger nine. And under normal circumstances, the message, the decoded message is cleaned up normally so that it can be decoded, read, and a normal protein made. For myotonic dystrophy, whether it's type one or type two, you have too much. You have too much, and it starts to bend on itself. And so all of those molecules that would normally clean up the message are working overtime trying to clean up this excess message. 
And they're so busy with this excess message that they can't decode other messages, other DNAs, other uh, codes, as uh, if you say, if you can say. So because of that, not only is this gene not decoded and read properly, but other genes are not decoded and read properly because these proteins are too busy trying to deal with this excessive message. It's almost like fly paper, it's sticky. And all of those necessary proteins are stuck to it and can't do the job for other genes. So what does this cause? These other genes are important for many of the functions that we see affected in myotonic dystrophy. So there's a gene uh, that decodes a protein necessary for relaxation of muscle. But because that message was not cleaned up and read properly, myotonia. There's another gene that, that gives a decoded message for a protein that's important for heart rhythm and heart signaling. But if it's not decoded properly, then you're going to get an abnormal system and heart defects. So this is why we think myotonic dystrophies have multiple organ and system abnormalities. One message is repeated over and over. And so the whole system cannot even decode and read other genes, other messages necessary for human function in life. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about how all of this clinical data, all of these observations, what we know about patients, um, has really helped us learn how to care for our patients. And so um, there's two quotes that I love. The faculties developed by doing research are those most needed in diagnosis. And so a lot of the basic science research that's done in the lab by our scientists has led the way in understanding why we know this disease affects multiple systems. But it's also a lot of this observation that's helped us understand how to manage our patients. So the clinical history is very weighty when it comes to our patients because of all of these systems that we have to be aware of. So let's talk about this because, because not all patients have a family history where a baby is born or a child is born. Obviously, some patients don't even know they have myotonic dystrophy until late in life. And so unless there's a suspicion or they see a doctor who's aware of it, they can be missed. This is a patient who I stumbled across in a charity clinic. She was 57 at the time, and she came to our clinic because of pain in her groin. Um, she had had some um, infections in the past, and when we started asking her more and more questions, she talked about, well, I couldn't relax my hand when I was younger. I couldn't walk on my toes, my mother said, and my father had myotonic dystrophy. But it never occurred to her that she might have it. When you look at her, though, um, you can see the lid drooping. You can see a little bit of the weakness around the mouth and a little bit of the weakness of the forehead and the elongated face. So we had a suspicion because we were familiar. She also had a grandson and a daughter who had some signs and symptoms that suggested that maybe it had been passed down. We were able to bring her into our multidisciplinary clinic and confirm that she indeed had myotonic dystrophy. And ever since then, she's been getting care from neurologists, cardiologists, lung doctors, therapists, um, so that we can manage her, uh, provide recommendations, and improve her quality of life and outcome. But it required an index of suspicion. This is a, a one of my patients who uh, uh, actually is a lawyer and a, a uh, biology uh, PhD um, uh, researcher. And she was diagnosed um, in her late 40s, early 50s. And the only reason she was diagnosed is because she was having a regular checkup and her liver enzymes were elevated. And she went along the long path of having a liver biopsy. And then some of the other testing revealed that she had muscle problems 
And she had another test, which uh, called an EMG nerve conduction, the electrical test, which showed myotonia. Long story short, she was confirmed to have type two. And when we looked at her family history, her father had had a pacemaker and cataracts and died very young, as well as her father's brother, her uncle, who also had a pacemaker in her 40s. If she had not been diagnosed, it's very possible that she might have had a cardiac problem, even had a complication, and never knew why. But because she was able to be diagnosed and cared for uh, by a cardiologist, neurologist, she herself is doing well. She has a pacemaker now, she's exercising, and she's still working. This young woman was diagnosed at 16 due to myotonia, no family history. She just noticed that she couldn't release her hands and she was very physically active and so she sought evaluation. Uh, she went on to go to physical therapy school and because she was educated about her disease early, she was tied to clinical care, she was able, once she got married, to uh, work with a fertility specialist to deliver healthy babies who didn't have the disease. Again, knowledge is power, and that's why we're here today for you. Um, this is a case which is very common in our myotonic dystrophy patients' uh, lives. This young woman actually didn't know she had myotonia. Uh, she herself had been adopted, and she gave birth to a son who had congenital myotonic dystrophy. Uh, because of his diagnosis, she was also found to have 400 repeats. And when you ask her, she, when she looked back on her history, she said, yes, I did have myotonia. And you know, I did have cataracts at 34, but she never knew. When she found her birth mother, guess what? The mother had myotonic dystrophy as well. And she's doing well, she's in our clinic, she's thriving and still working and taking care of her son. So my last case is one of survival. This is what knowing about your disease and accessing care and connecting with specialists who know about your disease can do. This is a 35 year old who was diagnosed in 1999 and his father had died from dementia, brother died from chest pain. We think they had myotonic dystrophy. And over several years, when we started taking care of him in 2005, the cardiologist saw him, we evaluated him and his heart was managed. He had some abnormalities, his breathing was okay. But as time went by, we started noticing that his breathing was decreasing from 64% of normal to 45% of normal. He had some liver issues that we were able to manage, as well as his EKG began to change a little bit. Again, his breathing had dropped and we started putting him, uh, sent him to a lung doctor. He was on a BiPAP or CPAP for breathing. His EKG continued to change and show progression. Um, he was lost to follow up for a while, but came back had a pacemaker placed, uh, was on a CPAP at night, and doing much better with rehab. Again, it's important to know that from 1999, even today, with good care, he's thriving and living with his wife and doing well. So myotonic dystrophy can be challenging because you see the full spectrum as we discussed. And some patients don't know they have it unless there's a strong family history or a child born or something that another doctor stumbles over. And so patients can go undiagnosed and probably there are more patients with myotonic dystrophy than we know. Sometimes, as I said, the patient has minimal symptoms or there's no family history or they just can't access medical care. And in terms of physicians and the healthcare system, sometimes physicians aren't aware uh, about some of these signs and symptoms, and, and they're not able to refer the, the patient to the right specialist. So all of these factors, again, education is power. What we know is that in the United States, we have um, about 15 out of 100,000. For every 100,000 persons, 15 have myotonic dystrophy, we think. So that would be about 50,000 in the United States, and for Texas, where I'm from, about 4,000 and maybe 400 in Houston. But I suspect that the numbers are higher because there are patients walking around who don't know they have myotonic dystrophy and need to be diagnosed. These are a few of the pictures of our multidisciplinary clinic in Houston, Texas. Uh, we have 14 team members, a lung doctor. We've been blessed to have a cardiologist.
uh, physical therapists, speech therapists, nutritionists, all so that we can manage, identify, and treat these issues before they cause complications or change someone's life tremendously or even cause death. And so we see about 20 to 30 patients uh, each clinic. Um, we have four clinics a year. And we've been able to increase the number of patients we see by 42%, uh, from 14 patients in 2007 to over 20, 25 patients now. And so we've been able to put in pacemakers, do sleep studies, diagnose diabetes, treat cardiovascular disease, just by having this clinic. And there are many notable clinics in our nation um, that provide this excellent care. And we're, we're proud to be in great company. I, with that said, we talked about the wealth of clinical um, information and the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation of America leads the way in educating patients and the community, even healthcare providers, about how to care for patients and also up, up, updates on research. So this is a website that I think everybody needs to know. This is the website page for the Myotonic Dystrophy Toolkit and publications. You as the patient can go to myotonic.org, and you can actually download a lot of these clinical care recommendations and hand them to your doctor, hand them to your primary care, hand them to your heart doctor, hand them to your neurologist. And so what's on this webpage? There are clinical care recommendations for patients with type 1, whether they're adult or children. Type 2, there are recommendations for heart doctors and lung doctors. And even in lieu of this COVID pandemic, we as a community of health care providers came together early in the spring and put together recommendations for you so that you could navigate during this time. Uh, many of these guidelines have been published in, in, in um, well-known uh, scientific and uh, medicine-based journals, as well as a continual study, this is the optimistic study, where we're continuing to observe and collect data on how patients progress how diseases present so we can continue learning and helping our patients. So what are the typical guide guidelines? We've talked about that this is a multi-systemic disease. So what that means is that a patient needs their heart evaluated, an EKG every year. They need to have a cardiologist. They might need a Holter or echo or even imaging of the heart every one to two or three years. They need their lungs checked. We call these pulmonary function studies a baseline sleep study because of the apnea, blood work because of the hormone issues, and just a general healthcare screen because there are other issues involved, including GI, maybe cancer risk, and to see therapists that can help patients with how to deal with swallowing issues, nutrition, and just accessing help, social services, and rehab. I want to end here by stressing the anesthesiology guidelines. I think this is critical. You can also find this on the Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation website because surgery anesthesia can pose a huge risk to our patients. And so this is a copy of the anesthesia. This is the short form. There's actually a much longer form on the website, but you can access this, download it and hand it to your surgeon, hand it to the anesthesiologist hand it to all of your care providers so that they know how to treat you. Um, you have the education in your hands and we want to arm you with that so that you can advocate for yourself. So again, we talked about how the mutation causes multiple systems involved, but this also it has led and is leading towards therapies targeted at many of these um, inherited defects that are affecting multiple systems. These are some of the therapeutics. I won't go into much detail because we have some great speakers that are gonna to talk to you about where we are in therapy and research. Just know that there is a wealth of research and clinical trials that are being developed and have been developed looking at treating our patients and improving outcome. So this is a busy timeline, but this is just to highlight the progress we've made from the early 1900s when myotonic dystrophy was first diagnosed by Dr. Steinert to, the, to now um, in the 2000s, 2015, and now 2020, when we have done gene therapy trials, we have uh, increased knowledge as to what's going on on a molecular level, 
And now we can put together care guidelines, which I believe is improving outcomes and saving lives. Again, it has been my pleasure to present to you. This concludes my talk on DM 101, the basics of the disease and how to care for yourself. I hope that uh, it answers some questions and I pray that you enjoy the rest of the conference. God bless.